Thank you for that kind introduction. It's an honor to be here in this uh, large crowd early morning. And I think it's especially appropriate um, to present a bit on the project on human development in Chicago neighborhoods, seeing as that NIJ was really an historic a funder of this project early on, along with the MacArthur Foundation. It was an example of a private public collaboration that is somewhat unusual in science. A bit on um, a caveat before I start, I'm not a policy expert and this project is not policy evaluation. So I find this to be an interesting panel and I've titled it Translational Criminology. It's a bit of an experimentation. My own view is that research is about producing knowledge and that knowledge we think um, is relevant to policy, but that link is is difficult. And furthermore, practice informs research. And that going back, I think, is not done as much in the field of criminology. So I'm very much looking forward to um, hearing from Commissioner Davis and Chief Davis on their thoughts on practice. And, and hopefully, um, it's, at some point, um, the ideas that come out of this panel may be implemented. I'm going to start off with the thesis. And it's pretty simple, really, um, but you have to put this in the context of our contemporary era, where much of the thought in social sciences, but also the public at large, is about the opposite, namely how globalization, for example, has flattened the world. One of the best-selling books, Thomas Friedman, um, The World is Flat. In social science, Anthony Giddon, a key social theorist, talks about placelessness, or the idea of place as phantasmagoria. Cell phones, Twitter, whatever. Um, you know, you're walking down the street, everyone seems to be talking to someone else rather than, than where they are. Um, they're constantly running into me in New York. But in the world um, of placelessness, that, that thesis is right at some levels, but it's really wrong, I think, when it comes to crime and many other social phenomena. A, there's a deep neighborhood concentration to crime. But, and this is important for criminologists, it's important for social scientists, it's not just about crime. There is a deep social concentration in space across multiple social phenomena, and I'll give you examples of that. Thirdly, and this is tricky, there's change, right? I mean, poverty's gone up, it's gone down, there's gentrification, there's increasing immigration, diversity, there's the idea that neighborhoods are constantly changing. They are, but there's a persistence to the structure, and I'll show it to you. A persistent inequality. And finally, it's not just about poverty, and that's one of the old mainstays of, in sociology and criminology. It's important, uh, race is important, and I'll show you how, but social and cultural mechanisms are crucial in helping us explain that. So, some examples. Let's start with crime. This is a map of Chicago, site of the uh, project. And I've tried to make this simple. The stars here are homicide events proportional to the size of the population. Something like over 3,000 homicide incidents, and this is from the most recent data we were able to get from the police department, um, were coded in time and space. And the larger the star, the more the homicide. And what I've done in each of the communities is to array them by what I call child health, simply low, medium, or high. And this is based on a scale of infant mortality and low birth weight babies, which is a, epidemiologically a strong indicator of child health. And what you'll see um, is that there's a strong link. Areas of high violence are corresponding to areas where children are growing up in, in a quite disadvantaged neighborhood and have low health. Now this has many implications. Just to give you one recent study actually using our data, I, I, not for me, Pat Sharkey showed that exposure to violence among children led to cognitive deficits in learning that lasted many years. So child health, child learning, child intelligence, deeply connected to violence, and these are in turn part of a spatial story. The response to crime in the criminal justice system is perhaps even more concentrated. This is a map of concentrated incarceration. Actually, we hear a lot about mass incarceration. I prefer to think of it as the local 
concentration of mass incarceration, because it's actually not mass. If you'll note, well, I don't think I have a, yeah, I'm gonna forget the laser pointer <laughs> given this. Um, you'll note a top third or more of that map in the city, there are areas where it's even low, in fact, some communities hardly any incarceration. It's highly variable, and then some areas, such as Austin and the west side, and the south um, west side, have very, very high rates of incarceration. So this is deeply concentrated as well. Moreover, crime, like incarceration, is persistent. I want you to, um, if possible, look at this um, chart a little bit, because it shows you two things. It shows, shows you not only the persistence of incarceration, um, on the x-axis is the incarceration rate in 1990 to 95, and on the y-axis to the left is the incarceration rate up to 2005. Over almost a 10-year period, that is a straight line. In social science, we often don't see lines like that. It's a correlation of about 0.98, so not much is changing. But the other thing you need to know is that the communities up to the right are those that are predominantly black, and the communities down to the left are predominantly white. And the differentials here are not just modest, they're not even large, they're shockingly large. In fact, the two red arrows point out the highest rate of incarceration in the black community and the white community, that is predominantly white community, that has the highest rate of incarceration. The differential is over 40 times. Okay, that's not a typo. The highest rate incarceration black community has a rate over 40 times higher than the highest rate white community. So there's deep persistence, deep inequality by crime, by incarceration, by child health. That much is clear. You might say, well, look, things have changed. We just had an economic crisis. Gentrification has roiled um, neighborhoods from in the 90s, 2000s, that's true. But the structure, the pecking order, if you will, um, is quite stable. This is a map or chart of concentrated disadvantage, poverty, welfare assistance, female-headed families in, in 2000. The census data um, can't even be looked at yet because it averages it from 2005 to nine, but we were able to obtain housing vouchers um, from Chicago Housing Authority as an indicator of low-income residents. When we chart that out, again, strong persistence, and if anything, some communities that were already poor got worse, the ones you see up in the, the corner there to the upper right. Well, this is a conference on criminology. We're all familiar with the great crime decline. Doesn't that mean that things changed? Yes, crime went down. Crime went down in New York, we hear about that. It went down in Chicago, went down in a lot of cities. But the change, or the secular large-scale change, is being superimposed on a relatively deep ecological structure. The red line is basically the rate of decline in violence in Chicago over the 10-year period, 1995 to 2010, 15-year period, actually. But if you look at the other side, the violence rate in 1995 and the violence rate in 2010, what you see is, again, another straight line. And you think, well, how can, that, how can they both be true? Well, it's actually very simple. It's going, the line is going up or down. Crime is increasing, decreasing, but most communities are falling on that line, meaning there's a relative stability to the crime rate in communities. And that's a powerful finding. I think it's relevant to practice. Um, it's relevant to, to theory.